Okay. Good morning, everyone. All okay? Good. Um, it's a bit weird, isn't it? It's all a bit weird. Well, I'm finding it a bit weird. I don't, I don't know about you. Um, but I think the best thing that we can do when we're <laughs> feeling weird uh, is to turn to God's word. Yeah. Oh, look at that. That was like spontaneous. Um, so let's do that. Let's turn to God's word. We are carrying on our Exodus series this morning. So uh, could you turn to Exodus chapter four? We are going to be covering quite a lot of scripture this morning. So rather than having one person jump up and read through nearly two chapters uh, worth of scripture, um, what we're going to do is going to work our way through the text. I'm going to read a bit, then I'm going to make some comments, then read a bit and make some comments and stuff like that. Um, just to catch you up uh, in terms of where we are, last couple of weeks we've been camped out in Exodus 3 and 4 in Moses' encounter with God at the burning bush. And we've been looking at God's revelation of his heart and his character and his plan for Moses and for the people of Israel. And then last week, Ben served us wonderfully well by looking at Exodus chapter four and Moses' reluctance, kind of his pushback, the excuses he makes as to why he doesn't want to do what God's calling him to do. But what we're going to turn to this morning is in chapter four, five, and uh, the beginning of chapter six, is we're going to see what happens next in the story when Moses does actually say yes to God. You know, after all the signs that God gives him and all the reassurance and all the excuses, we get to this point where Moses finally obeys and we're going to see what happens when he obeys. And this is a really you know, important uh, thing for us to think about because actually obedience is at the heart of what it means to be a disciple, isn't it? In John chapter 14, verse 15, Jesus says, if you love me, you will fill in the blank. Like what, what, what is, what's Jesus about to say? If you love me, you will worship really, really exuberantly. Well, yes. If you love me, you will be kind to everybody. Yes. You know, if you love me, you will give some of your money to me. Yes. Okay. But if you love me, you will keep my commandments. That's what Jesus says. And then in John 15, he says, you are my friends. If you, what, talk to me all the time? Spend loads of time with me? Well, yes, but actually you are my friends if you do what I command you. Yeah? Who wants to be a friend of Jesus? Yeah, I want to be a friend of Jesus. Moses is described as a friend of God. And obedience is not the means of our friendship, but it is the measure of it. It's not the way that we become friends with God, but it is the evidence of our friendship with him. So we're going to look at four things that kind of relate to obedience uh, this morning and the journey that Moses goes on and often the journey that we need to go on as well. The first of those is that obedience bears fruit. The second is that obedience brings opposition. The third is that uh, opposition brings discouragement. And then the fourth is that discouragement is overcome with gospel, gospel promises. Okay, so that's where we're going to go. That sound okay with everyone? All right, let's pray and then we'll dig into the passage. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that it is enduring. We thank you, Lord, that it stands forever, Lord God. And so we just pray, Lord, that you would come by your Holy Spirit afresh now as we turn our attention to this ancient story. Lord, we thank you that there is much for us to learn about what it means to follow you and much for us to see of you. And so we pray, Holy Spirit, that you would help us to do that this morning for your glory. Amen. Amen. Okay, let's start then reading in chapter 4, uh, verse 27. That's where we'll pick up the story. Okay, so it says, The Lord said to Aaron, uh, Go into the wilderness to meet Moses. So he went and met him at the mountain of God and kissed him. And Moses told Aaron all the words of the Lord with which he had sent him to speak and all the signs that he had commanded him to do. Then Moses and Aaron went and gathered together all the elders of the people of Israel. Aaron spoke all the words that the Lord had spoken to Moses and did the signs in the sight of the people. And the people believed. And when they heard that the Lord had visited the people of Israel and that he had seen their afflictions, they bowed their heads and worshipped. Okay, so let's think about obedience bearing fruit to start with. Things get off to a pretty good start. 
don't they? For Moses, when he finally decides to obey, first thing that happens is that Aaron, uh, God speaks to Aaron and Aaron listens and Aaron obeys himself and goes to meet with Moses and he listens to what Moses has to say and he sees the signs that God has given Moses to perform and crucially he believes and he partners up with him and he goes all in and he says, yeah, let's do this. This is what God's calling us to do. I'm on board. And so from Moses' perspective, you're like, great, this is a this is a good start. And then they go to the elders of Israel and Aaron does the talking, just as God said that he would provide Aaron to do the talking. And he speaks to the people of Israel. He speaks to the elders and um, he tells them all that God has told Aaron and he shows them the signs and they believe just like God said they would believe. And so if I'm Moses at this point, I'm thinking, do you know what? I don't know what I was so worried about. All of those excuses I made, all of those kind of reasons I gave for why I couldn't listen to God and do what he was calling me to do. Actually, do you know what? This is, this is a breeze. Like Aaron's on board. The elders are on board. Everything's going well. Everything is happening exactly as God said it would happen. And actually, even more so, like not only do the elders believe, actually, they're so encouraged by what they hear. They're so empowered by what they see. They're so encouraged that God has seen their reflection that they break out in this spontaneous worship service. I mean, that is pretty much the best outcome that you can get if you step out in obedience. And the result is that other people worship God. Yeah, you're doing pretty well. You know you're on to a good thing, that your obedience leads others to worship. And so what we see is that Moses' obedience is bearing immediate fruit, right? And there are times, yeah, where I believe that we should expect this, and there are times that we will experience this. For example, you might feel God calling you to step into something new, yeah, or step out of your comfort zone. It might be a new job that you step into. And as soon as you're in that job, you just see fruitfulness. Yeah, everything that you're doing is working out well. People are responding really well. And you can immediately feel like, oh, I can, I can see that I've, I've obeyed. Yeah, and here's the fruit that's coming out of my obedience. Or it might be that you step into a new ministry role within the church or take on a new responsibility and, and you just feel like, oh, I'm in my lane now. Like this is, I'm using the gifts that God has given me. People were responding really well to me. You know, everyone's really, really positive so I can see the immediate fruit. Or you might feel God calling you to step out and invite someone to a church event or invite someone uh, to, to, to a Sunday morning or even to offer to pray for somebody. And you're like nervous about it, but you just really feel convicted in your heart. No, no, this is what God's calling me to do. And you do it and they respond really positively. The other say, yeah, I'd love to come. Or they're open to you praying for them. Or even more amazingly, you know, you, you, you sit, they're telling you that they've got some kind of pain in their body. And so you feel God prompting you to pray for them and you pray for them and they get healed. And there's immediate fruit that comes from your step of obedience. And so I think on some level, we should expect this. In John chapter 15, Jesus says, look, if you obey my commandments, then you will abide in my love. And if you abide in my love, you will bear fruit. OK, so there's there's like a process going on. Yeah. Obey my commandments. That's how you abide. And if you are abiding, if you're walking closely with me, then you will bear fruit because apart from me, you can do nothing. But if you're connected into the source and into the vine, you will bear fruit fruit. So sometimes when we obey, things go well. Yeah. And our faith and our confidence grows. And often in those times we take it as a sign. Okay. This is confirmation. I heard God right. Yeah. And I'm walking in God's will. So if I was Moses in this situation, okay, I would be ticking the things off my list. I'd be thinking, okay, step one was connecting with Aaron. Tick, right? Done that. That's gone well, right? Step two was go and speak to the elders of Israel. Tick, done that. They've listened. They've believed. They're moved. Their worshiping is even better than I could have imagined. Okay, so tick that one off. So step three, right? Look down on my list. What's step three? Go to Pharaoh and tell him, let my people go. That'll be a breeze, right? And steps one and two have gone really, really well. So I'm full of confidence now that I can go to Pharaoh and that step three is going to be 
um, just as easy as step one and two. So let's see what happens. Let's pick it up in uh, chapter five, reading in verse one. Afterward, Moses and Aaron went and said to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, let my people go that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. But Pharaoh said, who is the Lord that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord. And moreover, I will not let Israel go. Then they said, the God of the Hebrews has met with us. Please let us go a three days journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God, lest he fall upon us with pestilence or with the sword. But the king of Egypt said to them, Moses and Aaron, why do you take the people away from their work? Get back to your burdens. And Pharaoh said, behold, the people of the land are now many, and you make them rest from their burdens. And the same day, Pharaoh commanded the taskmasters of the people and their foremen. You shall no longer give the people straw to make bricks, as in the past. Let them go and gather straw for themselves. But the number of bricks that they made in the past, you shall impose upon them. You shall by no means reduce it, for they are idle. Therefore they cry, let us go and offer sacrifice to our God. Let heavier work be laid on the men, that they may labor at it and pay no regard to lying words. So, obedience bore fruit, but now we see that obedience brings opposition. Things were going smoothly, things were going well, and then suddenly Moses and Aaron hit a very large pharaoh-shaped wall. Yeah, they start off, don't they, with great confidence. Verse 1 of chapter 5, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, let my people go. If I was them, I would have done it in a deep, booming voice just for added effect. <laughs> let my people go, that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. Yeah, they're, they're high on their success so far. And then they are met with Pharaoh's response, which is very dismissive. Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, and moreover, I will not let Israel go. Now, we talked about how for the first two steps, they went as well as they could go. This is about as bad as it could go. And in fact, things are going to get worse. And you can just imagine in that moment how Moses and Aaron feel. All of that faith and confidence yeah, that was there just goes out of them, like deflating a balloon. It just kind of falls out of them. And I wonder if you've ever had that experience where you step out in something that God calls you to do, and maybe it, it initially starts going well, and then suddenly you hit a wall, a barrier, an obstacle, negative response, negative reaction. And, and where you were in one moment, riding high on faith and confidence, and walking in God's will and his purposes, great things are going to happen. And then suddenly you hit a wall, and all of your confidence and faith just deflates right out of you. Now, here's the important question that we have to ask in this moment for Moses and Aaron. Are they still being obedient? Have they been obedient in what they've said to Pharaoh? Are they still in God's will? Right? And the answer to that question is yes. Right? Yeah, they're doing exactly what God has told them to do, but it's now not going to plan. Or rather, it's not going to their plan. So we need to draw out an important principle here, and that is this, that we don't measure whether we are in God's will by how well things are going. Or to put it another way, we don't assume that we've misheard God when things start to get hard or when we face opposition. A friend of mine did uh, quite a large, well, very large move uh, with uh, her family a couple of years ago and uh, recently had some communication with her and she was just listing all of their experiences so far that involved their car being stolen their house having mold so all of them got ill one of the kids having to have an operation one of the parents potentially having to have an operation the church shrinking in number uh, and the kids struggling at school yeah in just like the first year since they left and followed God's call to where he was calling them to go. 
And she said something along these lines, I've learned not to assume that I'm in God's will when everything is going well, and I'm out of it when everything seems to be going wrong. Just because things have been difficult, in fact, potentially the most challenging period of their life, she's still living with this deep conviction of like, no, this is what God told us to do. And we are walking in his will. So the reality is, rather than making us doubt we are in God's will, sometimes opposition actually affirms the fact that we are in God's will. And there are a few lessons that we can learn from how the enemy, our enemy, seeks to oppose us from what Pharaoh does and how he opposes Moses and Aaron. I just want to highlight briefly two of them. The first is that the enemy seeks to undermine God's power. Pharaoh is so patronizing and dismissive in what he says in verse 2. Who is the Lord that I, Pharaoh, should obey his voice and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, and moreover, I will not let Israel go. And we immediately see the effect that this has on Moses and Aaron. Whereas they started by saying, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel. After Pharaoh says, who is the Lord? I don't have to listen to what he says. And by the way, I'm not going to let the people go. Immediately in verse three, they slightly changed their tack by saying, then they said, the God of the Hebrews has met with us. Please let us go. Please let us go. <laughs> they started off really big and bold. Thus says the Lord. Pharaoh says, I don't know who the Lord is. Oh, well, please let us go. As if the decision really is in Pharaoh's hands and actually not in God's hands. And we see the same thing happening with the Israelite foreman. We haven't got time to read that section, but essentially what happens is that, um, you know, we read the bit where Pharaoh says, right, they've got to make bricks, but without the store anymore. And the foreman have to communicate that to the people and the foreman are beaten for the fact that the people aren't able to continue making that many bricks. And it says in verse 15, the Israelite foreman, then the foreman of the people of Israel came and cried to Pharaoh. Didn't come and cry to God. It's like from their perspective, right? Who, who holds the power in this situation? And when we face opposition, that's the question that we need to be asking, right? Who holds the power in this situation? Who am I making my case before? Who am I pleading to? Is it to Pharaoh who holds my life in his hands? Or is it to God? Who holds the power? You see, the opposition that they face has shaken their confidence in God's power. And that's how the enemy works. He works to undermine our confidence. In God's power. Secondly, the enemy seeks to undermine God's word. We read in verse 9, Pharaoh says, Let heavier work be laid on the men that they may labor at it and pay no regard to lying words. Pay no regard to lying words. So Pharaoh is saying, Your God is a liar. Or Moses and Aaron, you are liars. He's trying to undermine, yeah the confidence in God's word by calling them lying words. He is sowing seeds of doubt in God's trustworthiness. And it's exactly the same ploy that the enemy uses in Genesis chapter three with Adam and Eve, where he tries to undermine the trustworthiness of God's word. Did God really say, no, surely you won't die. And you know what? That is the prime tactic still of the enemy in how he opposes us from walking in God's will, by seeking to undermine our confidence in God's word. Can God really do what he said he can do? Is God really faithful? Doesn't look like it. Look around you. Could God really get you through this next season or this situation? The enemy sows seeds of doubt into our own hearts through his own lies. And notice Pharaoh's tactic. Yeah, he says, let heavier work be laid on the men that they may labor at it and pay no regard to lying words. What, the, what Pharaoh's trying to do is lay heavy burdens upon the people so that they cannot receive the word that God has spoken to them. And there are echoes of this idea in the parable of the sower, yeah, where Jesus Speaking about the seed dropped in the different places, says this in Matthew 13, 22. 
as what was sown among thorns, yeah, and that's the seed that, that grows up, yeah, and then kind of gets choked. It says, as for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and it proves unfruitful. And we see this if we skip forward to chapter 6, verse 9. Uh, after God has encouraged Moses, and we'll come to that in a bit, Moses goes back to the people to try and encourage them. And it says in verse 9 of chapter 6, Moses spoke of us to the people of Israel, but they did not listen to Moses because of their broken spirit and harsh slavery. They are not able to receive God's word because they are so weighed down by the burden of their current situation. And I think often in life, the enemy undermines God's word or chokes God's word in our lives by simply laying burden after burden after burden after burden upon us so that all the faith is squeezed out of us. So that our spirits become broken and we are not able to believe anymore or we are not able to live like we believe. And so sometimes what we need God to do and sometimes we need other people's help in this is to relieve those burdens so that we can receive God's word. And that, that is true for us in the church. I think it's particularly true. For those outside of the church who we seek to share the good news with. This is why we do ministries like CAP and Haven and other community focused ministries that are there to alleviate the burden. Because I'm sure Janine will testify, nobody's going to listen to what you have to say about Jesus while they're drowning in debt. Yeah, they are too burdened to be able to hear God's word. And so what we seek to do is, is why we do community focused social action stuff, is to relieve that burden. So they can receive the word and it brings life to them. But that is also true for us. We need to be aware. What are the burdens that I'm carrying? Some of us just, we, we hear things and you, you're, this will be your experience. You'll hear someone bring a word and you'll go, I know that's true, but I just, it's just like it bounces off. I just can't receive it. And often the reason that is because our spirits have just become weighed down. Yeah, and we just need God to just lift off that stuff so we can receive it again. A bit like Ben's word. To be able to lay down the thing that we're holding on to so that we have open hands and open hearts to receive the life-giving word that God has for us. Does that make sense? Okay. So we see that obedience brings opposition. Let's see what happens next. The next thing that we see is that ob opposition brings discouragement. And we see this first among the foremen. We read in verse uh, 20 to 21. They met Moses and Aaron who were waiting for them and they came out from Pharaoh and they said to them, the Lord look on you and judge because you have made us a stink in the sight of Pharaoh and his servants and have put a sword in their hands to kill us. Now that's not great feedback on your leadership. Yeah, as a result of what you have done, right, you have made us a stink to Pharaoh, yeah, and you've essentially put a sword in Pharaoh's hand. If you're a leader hearing that feedback from the people you're leading, you're thinking, okay, things haven't really gone very well here. The first fruit of their discouragement, yeah, is twofold. It's sudden distrust of their leaders and it's disunity among them. Yeah, they're facing suddenly even greater opposition. And what do they do? They turn on Moses and Aaron. And friends, I, I just want to implore you in this next season of uncertainty, okay, if things get hard or if things don't seem like they're going to plan, don't turn on your leaders and don't turn on one another because that's how the enemy loves to oppose what God wants to do. When we get discouraged and things get difficult, he just sows those seeds of distrust and disunity. Discouragement can be fertile soil for disunity and we must guard against it. We must guard against a culture of blame or a culture of accusation. You see, the foreman could have gone to Moses and said, Moses, look at what has happened. We need to cry out to God yeah, to do something about this. But rather they come to Moses and says, Moses, look what has happened. You've made us a stench. 
we are not with you in this moment. And when it gets difficult, we must make sure that we turn to the Lord and don't turn against one another. And we see the impact that their reaction has on Moses in verse 22 to 23 of chapter 5. Then Moses turned to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, why have you done evil to this people? Wow. Why did you ever send me? For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has done evil to this people, and you have not delivered your people at all. Now, I think Moses is on pretty thin ice here. <laughs> I mean, I know that we can be honest before God, and the scriptures definitely give us permission to be honest. And if you read through the Psalms, I mean, it's considering these are the prayers given to us to teach us how to pray. Some of the things that people pray and say to God are like, whoa, this is like a good example of that. When you say to God, why have you done evil? Like that is, I mean, that's out there, right? Like I wouldn't recommend it personally. Okay. But what's interesting is because of the people's reaction and because of what's happened to the people and because of the opposition that they're facing and because of the discouragement, Moses does what, let's be honest, we've all done at different points. Maybe we're even doing it in the current season we're in. We start to question God. And Moses does three things. Number one, he questions God, good, God's goodness. Yeah, at the very heart of it, that's what he starts to question. Why have you done this evil? And then he questions God's purpose. Why did you even send me? And then he questions God's faithfulness. You have not delivered this people at all. You said you were going to deliver them and you have not delivered them. And essentially what Moses is saying is, Lord, I did exactly what you told me to do and things have got worse. Anybody ever prayed that prayer? <laughs> Lord... I did what you told me to do. I said yes, and things have got worse. I'm even more opposed. I've been rejected. I've lost my job. I'm an outlier. I've lost friends. I've lost finances. I've lost some security and stability. Things are so messy. People are thinking wrong things about me. People are blaming me for stuff that isn't even my fault because I only did what you told me to do. And things have got worse. But here's the thing. Sitting in the background of Moses' situation and the thing that he would have done well to remember is that God told him this would happen. Yeah, in, turn back over the page to chapter 4. In verse 21, And the Lord said to Moses, When you go back to Egypt, see that you do before Pharaoh all the miracles that I have put in your power, but I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. Okay, very clear, right? So Moses should not have been going to Pharaoh with an expectation that when he said, thus say the Lord, let my people go, Pharaoh was straight away going to be like, oh, okay, yeah, no problem. Like God said, no, that's not going to happen. He's going to say, no, he's going to resist you. He's going to resist me. Now, we haven't got time this morning to go into the whole God hardening Pharaoh's heart, Pharaoh hardening his own heart. We might get to that at some point. But the reality is God told Moses that this is what was going to happen. So Moses should have been prepared to experience this opposition. You see, opposition will always discourage us if we are not prepared. We will be easily defeated if we are not ready for the battle. 1 Peter chapter 4.12 it says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. OK, so again, very clear. Right? Beloved, do not be surprised when the fiery trial comes as though something strange were happening to you. And yet, I won't ask for a show of hands, when we face opposition, when we face difficulties, who of us is still surprised? I am. 
as though something strange were happening to me. I obeyed and it's difficult. Why is this happening? Um, because you said it would happen. And yet we still react with surprise, like Moses is reacting with surprise. This is a strange thing, God. Why is this happening? Because I told you it would happen. Because you have a real enemy. Because there is a spiritual war going on. So you need to be aware and you need to be prepared. Otherwise, you will be overwhelmed. So we have looked so far at how opposition uh, bears fruit. How opposition brings, uh, how obedience, sorry, bears fruit, how obedience brings opposition, and how opposition brings discouragement. Then finally, as we close, let's think about how discouragement is overcome by gospel promises. I love how God responds in uh, verse 1 of chapter 6. But the Lord said to Moses, now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh. Now you will see what I will do to Pharaoh. The immediate encouragement is that the opposition is not a setback to God. And the opposition is not a surprise to God. He says, now, now you'll see. There is a sense that this opposition will actually be ultimately in the long run for Moses's benefit. Because now he will see what God will do. Okay, it's like. When we face opposition, it's like our spiritual resistance training, right? You know what resistance training is? Yeah, any kind of like weights or anything like that, you can tell I have a lot of experience, okay? But the definition of resistance training is that uh, resistance training increases muscle strength, yeah, by making your muscles work against a weight or force, right? So you, you, you're trying to do a normal action, and yet because you're holding a weight, it pushes you back right? It resists that normal action. And so as you push against the resistance, what happens? Your muscles get stronger, right? The more resistance, the stronger your muscles get. I don't know why I'm doing this. Okay. The, <laughs> start dancing. The more resistance, the stronger your muscles get. And opposition is resistance training for our faith. That the more resistance we face spiritually, and the more in God we push against it and see God take us through it, the stronger our faith becomes. The reality is, after what we shared on Thursday night, some of you this morning might be feeling discouraged. Yeah, but what if this moment and this season, if the time that God says to us, now you shall see what I will do. Now you shall see what I will do. Now you shall really see the power that is available to you in the resurrected Jesus. Yes, it's going to be difficult. Yes, things are going to push against you. Yes, it's going to be seasons of trial and hardship. Okay, but if you push against it by my grace, I will take you through and I will show you my might. I will show you my power. I will show you my faithfulness. Now you will see what I will do. Notice how God responds to Moses' questions. Yeah, doesn't answer any of them. <laughs> Literally doesn't, just totally ignores the questions. Like they're totally not relevant. Yeah. God says, why? Moses says, why have you done this? Why have you done that? Why have you done that? God doesn't even answer his questions. But what he does do is firstly, he reaffirms his own identity in verse 2, God spoke to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord. Like, that's God's answer. I am the Lord. Like, that's what you need to know right now in this situation, above every other thing and every other question you have and all the details that you want. And maybe, again, this applies to some of us this morning, okay, with all of our questions about what's going to come. What we need to know more than anything else is he is the Lord. He is the Lord. He doesn't tell Moses what he wants to hear which is the answer to his questions. He tells Moses what he needs to hear. And he says five things that we could describe as gospel promises because each of them point to and find their ultimate fulfillment for us in Jesus. They are foreshadowings of what Christ came to do. Let's read in verse five to eight, just as we come into land. It says, moreover, this is God speaking. I have heard the groaning of the people of Israel, whom the Egyptians hold as slaves. 
and I have remembered my covenant. Say therefore to the people of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from slavery to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment, and I will take you to be my people, and I will be your God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God, who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will bring you into the land that I swore to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will give it to you for a possession. I am the Lord. Bookended. Just in case you didn't get it, I am the Lord. I am the Lord. Start with and finish with the nature of who God is. And then in the middle, these five amazing gospel promises. I am faithful to my covenant. Number one, I will deliver you. Number two, I will redeem you. Number three, I will adopt you. You'll be my people and I will be your God. Okay, and number five, I will give you an inheritance. I will give you what I have promised you. You see, Moses needed to keep standing on these promises in order to keep walking in God's purposes. And the same is true for us. So when things don't go to plan, or we don't know what the future holds. We remind ourselves we stand upon God's covenant faithfulness that he has written in the blood of Jesus. And so we know we can trust in that covenant, that that blood is an unbreakable covenant over us. We know that when we face enemies who resist us or push against us or surround us, we can remind ourselves of God's deliverance from our enemies that Jesus won for us at the cross and through his resurrection. <clears throat> when situations look bleak, we can remind ourselves of his power to redeem, to turn what looks like it's dead into life to totally turn situations around. When we feel alone or isolated, we wonder if God is with us. We remind ourselves that we are his people. We remind ourselves that he has adopted us into his family, that we are his children and he is our father, that he has spoken his commitment over us, that he has said, never will I leave you or forsake you, that he has said he will not leave us as orphans, that he has sent his Holy Spirit to come and make his home in us. And when we suffer loss, which, newsflash, we will, because that's what Jesus did, <laughs> And we are told that we have to share in his sufferings. When we suffer loss, <clears throat> we fix our eyes, not on our temporary circumstances, but on our eternal inheritance in him, which is locked and kept in heaven for us, imperishable and undefiled and untouchable by this world. You see, at the root of every discouragement that we face, whatever you're feeling this morning, is essentially a lie about God that needs to be silenced with a gospel truth. So whenever we're feeling discouraged, we need to ask the Holy Spirit to just root down in his loving, gentle, gracious way and show us where we've stepped into unbelief and ask him to bring us into the truth of the gospel. These are the truths on which we must stand. These are the truths that will see us to the promised land.